Oh, yeah, all right. I don't know what happened yesterday. I thought I had it working right, but I guess I didn't. Well, these talks, as you can tell, were not meant to be tightly integrated, but they're just meant to uh, explore a few ideas, much less astrological than normal. However, some of those ideas we don't get a chance to deal with because we have to move on. And that's what happened yesterday. At the end of the talk, uh, we had opened up a very big subject, and before we could do even uh, scant justice to it, we had to close for the day. And uh, so I'd like to take up there and talk about a few things that are important to the spiritual life, and then uh, move on to the topic for today. If you can recall from yesterday, we were talking about the afferent and efferent nervous systems, and um, we were saying that the afferent nervous system brings sensations to the brain, and that the efferent carry out uh, uh, active, uh, to carry out uh, impulses from the brain. By the way, I looked it up on Webster where they where they pronounce the words for you, and the the afferent is the proper pronunciation. Efferent has two pronunciations, but in both of them, the focus should be on the first syllable. All right. We spent time talking about the motor nerves, and we also talked about a little bit about the autonomic nervous system, both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, for activating internal organs. The motor nervous system is efferent. And it carries out impulses from the brain for um, voluntary actions. There are sensations that come from the inner organs to the brain, but they follow a different path than if we touch with our fingers. They belong to a different kind of uh, nervous system. Now, physiology teaches that the autonomic nervous system, both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, is completely involuntary. And that brings up a number of issues that are very important for a spiritual student. The first thing that it brings up is something that I address again and again. And that is the limits of waking self-consciousness. When we are awake and we're self-conscious of what's going on around us and our perception of what's going on around us, we can't conceive of being unconscious. But yet we fall asleep every night and we're not conscious. So the obvious fact is that we do have unconsciousness even though it seems unfathomable to us when we're awake. In our waking self-consciousness, we can conceive of uh, universals. And when we conceive of something being universally true, independent of any place or of any time, it seems like it's forever so. But the reality is that our self-consciousness, even though it is capable of some universals, is very small. It's like a little tiny island in a great big ocean. So our self-consciousness is not a big thing at all. From our spiritual studies, like studying the Rosicrucian Cosmo Conception, 
we read about other worlds. And we, we do have emotions, so we know we have a desire about it, and we do have thoughts, but we're not highly conscious of all of those other worlds. Intuitively, we assent to their existence, we know they're there, but eventually we lapse back into our relatively more unconscious state and we don't know we you know we don't live in that consciousness all the time we think that our consciousness is rich and that it's pithy only to learn out later on that our consciousness is really quite thin these are a very illusory outlooks and ultimately because they are so illusory and because our consciousness is so unlimited, uh, we are both insecure and egoistic to overcome that insecurity. So, the things that we have that are derived from these illusionary views of the reality of our consciousness we have a hindrance to our spiritual progress. Our advancement would be much, much better if uh, we didn't assume that we know or think we know so much. It would be better if we returned to the opening pages of the Cosmos Conception where we are told to act as if we know nothing and to believe everything until we can later on prove whether it is true or not true. Now this applies to what we want to talk to or talk about with neuroconsciousness. From the study of uh, neurophysiology, we, it's clear that we are not conscious of many of the things that are taking place in our bodies. We mentioned the other day that every second each one of us makes two million new red blood cells. Two million every second. That's a lot of activity going on in this room when it seems kind of sleepy. Now, it's clear that somehow the greater part of our spiritual being knows or is in some way uh, knows what's going on and is in control of what is going on because everything is functioning and going well. It's not like the body is a machine that we just let it run and it runs until it runs down. We're in it and the spirit has something to do with the way it functions. But it's clear that the way we do it is not um, with the same kind of consciousness that we do things deliberately. We only use our bodies the way we drive our cars to a small extent. If we are using our bodies the way we use our cars, we are talking about using the uh, motor nerve system. And that's a product of consciousness, but only a very small part of it. The consciousness that we do have through the senses and through the motor nerves in this world are a consequence of going into and having to survive in this deeply materialistic world uh, with all of our higher faculties cut off so that we are no longer completely clairvoyant as we were before the fall. We were driven out of the Garden of Eden. And so it, it, it's a matter of... Uh, having this kind of consciousness for survival, 
but having lost or having never really gained self-consciousness in other ways. And uh, there's even unconsciousness about things that we do with motor nerves. Suppose we're learning to uh, play a musical instrument or develop some kind of uh, athletic skill of some sort or another. We have to concentrate very hard and we have to play, pay attention to what we are doing and we have to continue to pay attention to what we're doing or what happens is we can't perform. And then a funny thing happens after we've done this for a while, it becomes part of us and we it lapses back into unconsciousness. So we don't think when we're walking. We can if we want to, but we normally don't think of what we're doing when we're walking. So that's uh, that's a uh, that's a different kind, or a seemingly different kind of unconsciousness. Now, some things about this are very good, and some things are very bad. It's good that we can have things. Uh, so that we don't have to have that degree of concentration all the time, or we would never get very much done. We would have to be thinking about everything we did, and we'd have to be thinking about ourselves, thinking about what we did, and it would become a rather cumbersome life. But on the other hand, uh, it's tough to lose consciousness. It's tough to lose control. You, this is a Scorpio speaking here, so a loss of control is something uh, uh, very tough to deal with. It's always difficult, or it's always not good when we lapse into an assumption or when we lapse into habit. Those are not good states to work from. Now, as these talks have gone on during the week, we have gone more and more toward the direction of speculation. In fact, by the time we're done today, uh, it's going to be pure speculation. And uh, I, I'm trying to share with you the process of working on these things. And I have questions about them. And one of those questions is, are there two or more different varieties of unconsciousness? That's a very important question. There's an application to this. Ah... Uh, I don't know, first let's define it in a different way. We are currently quite unconscious with regard to the desire world or to the world of life spirit. But is that unconsciousness about the desire world of the same variety as the rumbling of our guts? Or is it of the same variety of having learned how to walk and then having let that lapse back into unconsciousness and automatically just walking when we want to walk? Because we're striving to wake up. We're striving to be aware. And so we all want that precious intuition that comes from the life spirit. So it's important to understand what kind of unconsciousness we have if there are different kinds and what we can do about it and what we should not waste our time with. Now, it seems definitely progressive to want to think about the unconsciousness we have of life spirit and to become fully aware in that. That seems to be our destiny, that seems to be our future, and that is our relationship with God. But what about the other kind of unconsciousness, if there is another kind of unconsciousness? Do we want to be in control of the rumbling of our guts? 
Do we want to be in control of that in the same way that we are want to be in control of our desires? Or do we even want to be in control of our desires? Because if we're, if we're in control of them, we may not experience new emotions. That's what happens when you get too controlled. You have your own little fortress and everything in it is under your command, but you're not uh, interacting with the greater world. This is a very vital question. And I mean vital literally. Because I had a friend once that started experimenting with things like this. He started experimenting with breathing. He wanted to not only be aware of the breath, he wanted to be in control of it. Now, breath breath is one of those things that is... uh, semi-conscious. We can make ourselves breathe more swiftly or more slowly or more deeply or more shallowly. But normally, we are not in control of most of our breathing. And uh, he became in control of his own breathing. So that every bit of the breathing process was at his command and only in his command. But he found that when he stopped concentrating on it, he stopped breathing. This is a rather panic or a crisis-like situation. And he was (laughs) forced to keep his consciousness on his breath and continue that way, and he did that. He was uh, a very young man when this occurred to him. And he did that until he was exhausted and he passed out. And at that point, uh, the unconscious part of his being, working with the autonomic nervous system, took over and did the breathing as normal. And when he woke up, (laughs) he was happy to find out that he was breathing as usual and he never ventured into that territory again. Now, it's obvious from this that the deliberated waking self-consciousness that we have earned through the fall probably should not enter into autonomic activities. Perhaps that will be something that happens at a future time, but I suspect if it is, it won't be in the same way as we make our fingers move or something like that. I think it will be with an overarching type of consciousness that has things going on within it that are within the control of that overarching consciousness but without direct focus. If that is the way it is. But the question is whether it is eternally so or whether it is just for now, should we ever enter into control of autonomic function? This is an important question and uh, it has to do with an absence from the Rosicrucian philosophy. And very often what a person doesn't say is as important as what a person does say. So since we're looking at the nervous system, let's stay with it and take an example that's very important. In various places in the human body, there are neural plexes. Usually they are anterior to the spine, but not far from it. As with all parts of the physical body, there is a counterpart in the vital body. However, 
Since the vital body has fewer restraints than the dense physical body, things are a little bit different. To our consciousness, which is attuned to the dense physical body, the vital body seems uh, insubstantial. It seems like a ghost or a wraith. You can put your hand right through a vital body and not in any way disturb it. And at the same time, uh, it seems as if the vital body was would float away. In this, what we don't realize is that subtlety does not necessarily mean that something is without internal structure. We don't realize that even the whole chemical region of the physical world is held together by the universal spirit. And it's held together with a spirit that is subtlety beyond our current ability to conceive. The universal spirit is as powerful as it is subtle. Everything is held together within it and by the integrity of its own consciousness. To the degree, to the degree of its evolution, an individual focus of that universal spirit partakes of that very subtle but great power. So when a human being such as ourself creates an archetype for a new life and a new set of vehicles, its body and that its bodies and that archetype are held together by the will of that focus from the universal spirit. So the vital body, even though it seems to be quite insubstantial, is held together quite well, as are all of the other vehicles in our constitution. They hold together with an appropriate degree of uh, cohesion, though that's a physical word and I don't like using it. There are other differences between the physical body and the vital body. And these differences are somewhat a matter of degree. For instance, the further inward we proceed with our consciousness, the more the character of something is important rather than the form. The character of our physical body is not as important as its mass and its ability to hold together physically. So the organization of the counterpart of these neuroplexes has a distinct character about it. However, what we're saying, most physicians would say we're crazy in talking at this and they call it uh, superstition. But even though there is a cell for cell correspondence, there is something more that goes beyond that cell for cell structure. At least this is what is reported by almost every reliable observer. All observers report these forms of the neural plexes are wheel-like, or they are flower-like. They are wheel-like flowers that have petals. And the claim is that there are two different kinds of petals, one being following the activities of the other more. Because these etheric structures are like wheels, they have been given a name uh, from Sanskrit called chakra, which means wheel. 
Now, clairvoyant investigations, ancient and modern, eastern and western, have noted that there is a correspondence between the activation of chakras, conscious or subconscious, and the qualities and kinds of consciousness associated with that action. Some of the changes in consciousness are associated with simple abilities. Some people have the ability to work with their hands. Some people have a feel for plants, which we call a green thumb, and there are other things like that. In our times, representations of what are called chakras have become quite stylized. They're quite exotic and fanciful and all kinds of uh, elaborate uh, claims are made about them and what happens in your consciousness with regard to them. There are a lot of New Age fads and uh, the world and uh, a lot of people in the world are willing to believe those fads and... uh, are willing to enter into them, even if they are dangerous. Now, if we look in the published works of Max Heindel and the Rosicrucian Fellowship, we do not find a mention of them anywhere. This appears to be an intentional omission. And that seems rather peculiar. Obviously, Max Heindel was a very good seer. He even describes using etheric vision first to look at a letter that has been written and folded up and put in an envelope, and he describes how it looks to etheric vision, and then he looks at the same letter using desire world observation and he determines how somebody had had drawn information from a sealed letter that it had to have been by desire world vision and not by uh, etheric vision because it would be almost impossible to decipher the uh, uh, decipher the writing on that letter using etheric vision because there'd been so many layers one on top of another. That indicates a pretty good degree of clairvoyance. That indicates uh, a quite an excellent control. And it isn't a matter of disinterest, because Max Heindel was extremely interested in physiology. So interested that in the study of embryology, he states what the first two cells are when the sperm meets the egg what the first two cells are that are differentiated. And he states, and he states it uh, factually, like he knows. He says the first cell differentiated is a heart cell. And that the second cell differentiated is a pineal cell. So, if he is that interested in physiology, and is that capable of pursuing that interest with clairvoyance, it seems reasonable to assume there must be a reason for omission of mention of the chakras. And searching for that reason brings us right back to the autonomic nervous system. The plexes associated with chakras are part of the autonomic nervous system. They function on their own, independent of deliberate waking consciousness, the kind that we prize so highly. If we try to control them directly with waking consciousness, We are involved with sticking our nose in or interfering into something that's very delicate. And when we're talking about the control of the physical body, 
We're talking about something that's not only delicate, but dangerous. And just as my friend found out that it was uh, a dangerous thing to tamper with autonomic function, unfortunately, a lot of people are going to have that same experience with chakras. Fortunately, most people don't put that much energy into it or they would find themselves in great trouble. Now, the Rosicrucian order, the initiate order, does have exercises of various different kinds. We spent, uh, I think it was two years ago, we spent an entire summer school, ten lectures, just talking about Rosicrucian exercises. And so they have exercises, general exercises, which exercise the whole of our character, not some specific little part which makes us a specialist, and the specialist is always vulnerable, in terms of evolution, even the Darwinian evolution, when there is a global catastrophe, it's the generalists that survive, and the specialists never survive. They're good to do special things, but not for general evolution. There are, most likely, specific, uh, specific exercises for working with specific parts of our spiritual and physical physiology. But one has to be ready with them, for them first, because otherwise you get yourself into a lot of trouble. One has to have great control of one's consciousness, or it becomes dangerous. You have to have control. That's, that's the chief law of driving. You're responsible in any accident that you are not in control. We have to have the right intention. And if we're selfishly seeking certain kinds of spiritual states, that's not right intention. And selfishness always brings us into dangerous territory. So we have plenty of good exercises for developing the control of consciousness. And we have plenty of significant information and this is speculation on my part, but it seems to be that it is an obvious omission lest people get themselves into great difficulty by playing around with the autonomic nervous system that uh, no mention is made of it. Because I'm sure that Max Eindl knew that there were going to be plenty of fattest people that would try to do anything. If we do the work on our consciousness, if we are faithful with what has been given to us, no pains will be spared to see that when we need something more. The teachers of the Rosicrucian order are more eager for us than we are for ourselves to advance. They would love to give us all kinds of things that we could do if we were ready. There are some Western Christian mystics who are not faddists and who write quite sensibly about the chakras. And it, those people make very clear distinctions about what are called petals. And uh, they... They themselves say that the petals are not to be directly interfered with. But that when you develop the kind of consciousness that the neural plexus is meant to develop, then the petals take care of themselves. Now that seems to be a sensible way. If we build a character, if we build the talents with what we have right now, we don't have to worry about wheels and things like that. So, these writers usually say, develop the character attributes and forget about the rest. This is exactly what the Rosicrucian teaching does. If we have the character, it's easy to initiate us. If we have so much love that a baby or a wild animal or something like that is not afraid of us, 
We're about ready to be initiated. We don't have that kind of love that's dangerous uh, for us to try to seek that. So we focus on character building. All right. Now let's move. We're getting closer to our topic. We'll... <laughs> we're on page three of the notes and there are only four pages and we haven't gotten to the topic for today yet. The world of Christian philosophy is very good about following the admonitions and the commands of the biblical Christ. The chief of these are we are told to preach the gospel and heal the sick. Sharing the Christian mystical teachings of the Rosicrucian philosophy is preaching the gospel. Everything in the Rosicrucian philosophy that is the official stated philosophy is given at the okay or command of the living Christ. Not the biblical Christ, but the living Christ. Big difference. In fact, uh, sharing the philosophy is a very healthy thing for our soul sick society that is way too much focused on material things. Loving is something that's all inclusive and finding ways to share love so that it doesn't have to be limited to certain social vehicles is something that's wonderful. One of the highest expressions of love is creativity. Creativity is healing. It works out all of the contorted and poisonous things that we have developed inside of us and it brings the spirit through and into our creations and that is a very healthy thing. But the same energy that is used in creativity is the energy that is used in healing. It is that spinal fire, that spinal fluid is its most direct representation in our body. But it's only because we've gotten ourselves into the trouble that we've gotten ourselves into that uh, we have to spend a good deal of that energy in healing. If we had never fallen, we wouldn't have to heal because we wouldn't have been sick in terms of evolution. This means that healing itself has to be a creative activity. That's what we've been pointing to all along. We're saying that we make new people and we develop new ways of wholeness in healing. This is the power in the creative energy. But because it is spiritual, it has many facets to it. It has, in fact, even many names to it. One of the names is called life force. Some people call it sexual energy. Some people call it libido. Some people call it charisma. Some people call it personal magnetism. Some people call it spiritual fire. This is a great potency. And it has the ability to heal or to harm. It is something that can be indulged in for satisfaction. Whether it is magical vengeance or whether it is for personal pleasure. It can be used for creation or it can be used for divine union. Thus far, we have looked only a very little bit at healing. And we can see now a little bit how if it is misused, it can harm, it can harm one in one's own physical being or it can harm others. Now this is our last talk in this morning sub-series. And since we're all spiritual aspirants, it's time now to uh, look back, look at some things with this spinal fire 
and some of our spiritual aspirations, which actually are our duty. It's our duty to grow spiritually and to develop things. Now this brings us back to where we were just a few minutes ago. The spine. The spinal homunculi, the spinal nerves, the motor and the autonomic nerves. The ganglia and things like that. It's a big and very difficult subject. And we must admit, if we're true to ourselves, that in large, it's very uncharted waters for us. We really don't know a whole lot about the nerves, not even the people who study them full time. Now, the thing in particular that we're looking at, Max Heindel and the Rosicrucian philosophy have a good deal to say about it. But many of the details are not given. Perhaps this omission is for the same reason as the omission about the neural plexes. Because it might be dangerous to play with it. Max Heindel is almost a tease about this subject. He says very interesting and very evocative things about the subject in numerous places, and then he moves on. It's almost as if he's tempting us to be self-reliant and dig into the matter for ourselves. And that is how I'm taking it for these talks where he does say ex tell us to exercise great caution. Let's look about some of the salient facts of the sub subject, just a very few of them, not, not all of them, just to have them in our consciousness. We'll do some minor speculation, and toward the end of this talk we'll be purely speculative and we'll have some fun with that. Now, in several places in the Rosicrucian literature, the spine is mentioned. They are spoken of in terms of words used by Paracelsus and in alchemical formula. The chem alchemical formula of salt, sulfur, and mercury. The elements uh, in this formula are associated with the moon, Mars, and Mercury, respectively. For example, the autonomic part is associated with the moon, and with salt, and with the angels. The motor section, which is used for expending energy, is associated with Mars and sulfur, and the Lucifer spirits. The afferent section, which is responsible for sensation, is associated with Mercury and with Quicksilver and the Mercurians. Now, Max Heindel maintains that the spinal fluid is capable of being a liquid or a gas, just like the blood is. There's a lot of correspondences or a lot of similarities between the spinal fluid and the blood. They both carry nutrients. They both carry waste away. And so there, there, there are a lot of parallels. This fluid, when it is a gas to the inner eye, looks like a luminous fire. And uh, it passes up the spine from the sacrum and into the cranium. And it becomes the light, the inner light of consciousness in the cranium. And that fire, as it becomes light and the light of intelligence, was called by Paracelsus and other alchemists Azoth. And that Azoth is ruled by Neptune. Now, if this fire is turned downward, as it is when it's necessary for procreation, 
it is it comes under the Luciferic influence. The spine really isn't in three segments, but there are concentrations in different areas. For example, the uh, uh, the lunar part that is associated with autonomic ac- activities of the organs, because the organs are in the center of the body, is more concentrated in that part of the spine. When it's turned upward for healing or for creation, it uh, facilitates spirituality. And it does that in the development of the brain or when one projects through words of power. For the most part, all of the functions are found throughout the spine but they are concentrated in different sections. Just like we said, the autonomic part, the lunar part, is more in the center of the spinal column. In other places, such as in the message of the stars, Max Heindel speaks of the spine as having a double channel. This goes along with physiology, but it isn't a real obvious thing physiologically. And that the two channels of the spine are ruled by Neptune and Uranus. In the Rosicrucian Cosmo Conception, the philosophy speaks about the unused sexual currents coming up the right channel of the spine and into the heart. It doesn't say whether it is through the cardioplexus or not. And then through the larynx and then into the cranium and bridging the pineal and the pituitary body and then comes back through the spine is the way the energy functions in somebody who is mystical. Someone who follows the spiritual life primarily by the feelings and by the goodness of the heart. If someone is mental, that is, if someone is an occultist, the energy rises up the left side of the spine and it passes through the larynx and into the cranium toward the front, across the virtual bridge, back through the larynx, and then down to the heart on the return trip. This is mentioned with regard to esoteric training in the Cosmo Conception and other places in the teaching. In other places, Max Heindel tells us about seven Amshash pens, which are from uh, Persian mysticism of hundreds of years ago. And the seven Amshash pens were called the spirits before the throne. According to the Persians, one Amshash pen was for the sun itself, and that was for the whole year, and the other six rule each one two months of the year. Doesn't say whether they are adjacent months or opposite months. Max Heindel does not say whether the Amshash pens are what we call archangels, but he seems to be clearly intimating that. The Amshash pens influence lesser beings which are called izards. And these izards rule 31 pairs of spinal nerves, the average month being 30 plus days long. But it does not say whether it is talking about the motor nerves, which would be kind of unusual. It would mean that we could unfold spirituality by certain physical motions at certain times of the month. It's possible, but I just don't know. And it doesn't say necessarily whether they are autonomic nerves because there are pairs of them also. So this gives us a quite an elaborate view of the spinal system as it is seen with the spiritual eye. It opens up all kinds of things. It opens up an annual cycle 
through the central Amshash pen, and it opens up the possibility of a monthly or bi-monthly cycle of consciousness with regard to the spinal column and what we do with the spinal energy along it. It's, this is, you know, it's, this is exciting material. As spiritual investigators, it's worthy of a lot of study because the way Max Heindel speaks of them, they have practical applications, both in the spiritual world and in living in the material world efficiently. So as students of Rosicrucian philosophy, it is ours to see whether there is corollary or coordination between the three-part spine or between the six or seven-part spine and a cycle of 30-plus days. That requires sensitivity, that requires understanding. And it is ours to learn what it means. Now, in stating all of these things, because we're on the edge of speculation, we never put forth speculation as fact that's a very that lacks a lot of integrity unless we can prove something and have proved it to ourselves uh, to make definitive statements about uh, spiritual matters uh, is it's low low class it doesn't have character and on top of that it may be misleading to other people. For that, for that reason, everything that I'm saying, I'm putting in speculations. I'm putting in questions. Because I am not qualified or authorized to speak definitively. We are all fellow students. And in that, we're studying together. And we are encouraging each other in our studies. And we share the beneficial Results of our studies. That's what fellowship means. It doesn't mean that we uh, give a doctrine, an infallible type of doctrine. In fact, it is our duty to study and unfold. We can't serve, you know, you're serving if you dig ditches, but if you only dig ditches and never develop a better understanding, you're never going to advance in your service. So it is ours to both uh, serve and to, in that service, to learn more. Now we're about to drop off of the edge of speculation and right into speculation itself. Now some people abhor speculation. They want fact and certified fact only. Some people will even make themselves to be pseudo-authorities so that they can have fact. I'm one of those people that love speculation, but I love it with caution. And uh, I like when speculation can be brought to proven fact. That's sort of like if we're all moving forward into the future we have something firm that we can build on. You know, so we put new things out and sometimes we can forge forward on them and make them something real. So speculation is a bridge uh, between the known and the unknown. In science, the speculative part is called a tentative hypothesis. A tentative hypothesis that has to be proven. Provided no assumptions are made, speculation gives the intuition something to play on. Because we have to learn that truth, and the truth is of such a different character from our normal consciousness that we have to have some kind of a language or some kind of an interface. And speculation provides that kind of interface. This brings us to the last of astrological homunculus that we are going to look at. And these are 
I hope I have enough. I think I needed just exactly enough. If, if there aren't enough, I'll, I can print some more. I got one more here. In the Rosicrucian teaching, Max Heindel refers to the twelve cranial nerves as the gates to Jerusalem. Jerusalem being the holy city and the center of consciousness within our cranium. Now what I have uh, given you are listings of the twelve cranial nerves to help us speculate. Also, there is a listing that I typed the listing out of a physiology book. Uh, I hope you realize that a lot of effort went into that, and there may also be a lot of errors that went into it. Uh, and there is a table of what happens when each of the 12 cranial nerves is injured. Because sometimes we don't know how something functions until it's broken. Or we don't know how much we use the finger until we lose the service of that finger. Now there's one thing that's important to note about all 12 nerves, or pairs of nerves. All of these nerves have at least partial sensory function. Some of them have exclusive Sensory, sensory function. Sensory experience brings, sensory nerves bring experience inward for interpretation and to be fed to the spirit through the etheric brain. So this means that there are different kinds of interpretations or there are different kinds of experience that are brought in through the uh, sensory function of each of these nerves. Some of them are effect actions. They are capable of motor action. And they transmit uh, out from the brain. Some of them do both. Medical science wouldn't agree with all of it. For example, it is speculated that energy projected out the optic nerves has something to do with etheric vision. This means that if you can train yourself to look through the blind spot, and you can train yourself to look energetically through the blind spot, which is a state of consciousness, this is what is involved in etheric vision. Uh, science would agree that the ear can transmit sound just as well as it can receive sound. Uh, if you, you can set the, uh, uh, the eardrum vibrating and you can make a very, very weak sound come out of the ear. Most people probably couldn't hear it, but very sensitive instruments can do it. So, what we're trying to get at, and this is all speculation, is that these nerves have function beyond physical function. And perhaps different from physical function, which makes this all extremely, extremely difficult. So if we're trying to understand how we can have 12 basic different kinds of consciousness, depending on whether we focus our attention on one of the 12 uh, cranial nerves, and that all of these give us 12 very different points of view about reality, as this is what is implied in the statement from Max Heindel, we have something that is really quite something. In us, we have a little microcosm. We have a little a little homunculus that relates to the whole universe. So, we don't know 
whether there is something analogous between the spiritual function and the physical function. Uh, anybody who's ever looked into those sorts of things knows that sometimes there isn't and sometimes there is. Uh, we Hopefully, we think that there is. Now, the thing of it is, this is your homework. This is the last class and until we all get together again, which means that this is, since it's so hard, nobody will want to come back again because, because a little progress will have been made. Um, the thing of it is, is to understand which cranial nerve is associated with which sign of the zodiac, with which creative hierarchy, and from that we can get a we have a means of coming to a higher state of consciousness. We have only one definitive statement, and even that is in question. In Max Heindel's time, science was different. And what is now called the vagus nerve, Max Heindel called the pneumogastric nerve. This, you know, there are a lot of things that science has changed since Max Heindel's time, but in some cases the Rosicrucian Fellowship has not changed. For example, the uh, standard, the astronomical standard in Max Heindel's time was noon. And now for computation purposes, the astronomical standard is midnight. But we still keep our ephemeris based on noon as if it were some holy thing written in stone. And that's, that's a serious error. So we know that the vagus nerve is ruled by Aries. We're told that as a, an authority in the statement by Max Heindel. Maybe. Because it isn't clear from the statement by Max Heindel that he means that the vagus nerve and only the vagus nerve is ruled by Aries. Because some investigators think that all of the cranial nerves, because they are in the in the cranium, are ruled by Aries. And it isn't clear from Max Heindel's statement. So we're, if we're trying to solve this homunculus, we have a problem right from the beginning. Incidentally, there's a lot of information from various different times uh, in history, uh, going back to India and thing like, things like that, where the cranial nerves are associated with signs of the zodiac. None of them make any correspondences, and all of them state it like it's religion. That this is, this is what it is, but none of them give any understanding. This is why it's so wonderful. It isn't, it, the Rosicruci Fellowship is not a doctrine. There's meaning in it, and there's understanding, and there's explanation in it. And if you look at most of the information out there, it doesn't have that kind of explanation. It, it, it hasn't advanced in this way. And so in lieu of explanation, there's a lot of bullshit. <laughs> and the web is just filled with it. Now, a lot of authorities have claimed that the optic nerve is ruled by uh, Uranus. And I have found that to be true. In cases of exceptional observation, uncanny observation through the eye, uh, Uranus is always very prominent, very often conjoined the ascendant. And the auditory nerves, which are called something else, the vestibular coecleal, those nerves are apparently ruled by Neptune. And I have found this to be true also. So we have, tentatively, we have three signs of the zodiac pinned down with three nerves. We have Aries, Pisces and Aquarius. That only leaves us nine to speculate. <laughs> now, I've thought about this a lot. And I've come up with, these are all wild speculations. For example, uh, the facial nerve uh, could tentatively be ruled by Sagittarius. And the reason for that is that the facial nerve is 
necessary for smiling. And if this is true, it means that by smiling, you can actually change your consciousness and that if you can get at the essence of the change of consciousness and what goes into a smile, that uh, that you can get into that, you can get into a, a deep state of inner spiritual uh, consciousness. I don't know if it's true. Uh, it's a speculation. And so there's another set of nerves that is used for frowning. I think it takes... Uh, Less nerves to smile, to frown than it does to smile. And therefore you would think that, uh, cat, is it the other way around? I heard that it takes more to frown okay. than it does to smile. Oh, okay, that's more work to frown than it is to smile. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. alright. So this would mean then that Capricorn, which is the doer part of the, uh, ruled by Saturn, would be associated with the nerves involved with frowning. I think I got it written down here what what that is. No, I don't have it all written down. So that's to this now now we tentatively have five out of twelve and the rest are extremely, extremely hard. In some cases it's hard to tell from physical function. Like for example, is the Accessory nerve, or the accessory nerve, is that associated with cancer? Because we know esophageal activity, that's been known for centuries, is associated with cancer. And if uh, cancer, if the accessory nerve is associated with swallowing, there will have to be a coordination, so maybe we have cancer there. But then there's something... Who rules, who does Taurus rule? Does it rule the trigeminal, which is involved with mastication? Or does it involve the hypoglossial, which is involved with tonguing? Now these are things that, you know, we're making all kinds of assumptions or speculative assumptions. And so uh, it's something that we all have can have a good time. Now, of course, I expect feedback on this, that if you come to certain discoveries and if you can say that the physiological function is in no way connected, but except maybe biochemically or something like that, with the spiritual function, I'd like to hear that. But, uh, of course, I want to hear the justification and I want to be able to hear about how this is provable. Yes, fact. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> All right, that's as much as we have. Yes. Yes. Well, see, we've already stirred up some controversy and we've already stirred up all kinds of interest in different ways of looking at this. And I love it. This is, this is what this is intended for. It keeps us off the street. <laughs> all right, let's close with the Rosicrucian student's prayer. Oh God, increase our love for Thee so that we may serve Thee better from day to day. Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Good. Yeah, it's, it's a... <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. Well, with, with smell, with some of the other senses, they have receptors. Yeah, but... The no, it's a direct passage of uh, minute particles pass right into the nerves and right into the blood. Yeah. So the the, the current speculation is that um, in each molecule there's kind of a peculiar vibration of that molecule. Okay. And that um, and so they. They're speculating that smell senses that vibration. Oh, then that that could very well strongly associated with memory. 
That would make it Virgo then, because Virgo likes those discrete pitches. Interesting. What? No, I don't believe that. The 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 the, uh, the, uh, the pictorial memory is Cancer. Because the Cancer has all of the backwards movements from crayfish and crabs and the side leg and the backward movements and all of the photographically uh, perfect pictures in the ethers. That that's very Cancerian. So, yeah. yeah, but smell and memory and think of childhood right. and how you associate certain things with um, your parents, right. certain things with books. It's yeah. all smell. Yeah. I think it, that uh, smell has to be Ha- has to be Scorpio because there's the smell of danger and Scorpio is the <laughs> yeah in street in, in street psychology they do too it's not a it's a pro it's a pro no no it's a profane thing that uh, uh, it's woman talk that corresponds to ribald man talk. They say there's a relationship between the size of the nose and the size of the penis. <laughs> you, you haven't heard that before? No. That, that's uh, that, talk I haven't heard before. Well, that, maybe that's man talk putting words in, into women talk. <laughs> uh, all right. I think we need to make these decisions now. <laughs> no. no. I, I, I don't, since we back next year if we haven't figured this out. Uh, I think we can figure this out. Where is the email? We can figure this out. <laughs> <laughs> there have been a lot of people that have tried to figure it out. Yeah. See that Jean Francois would probably say that it is a matter of uh, a, a geometric thing, where they, you know, every third one is, you know, like is set up like that. That's that's uh, that's clearly the way he thinks that, uh, along those lines. See, because there's another rhythm, the rhythm that he saw between the septical uh, and the um, and every third one uh, ruling the days of the week, there's another rhythm between 24 hours, which is uh, uh, 3 times 8 and 24, so that the uh, first hour of each day is uh, is the next day, yes. Yeah. So the second one, yeah. yeah. The 25th hour is the yeah. next day. Yeah. Well, yes. Since the whole thing is zodiacal, and we have to um, work with uh, the uh, aspects. The aspects are what are what we are given to work with. Would one not think then that the trine and the aspect would represent certain ones of these? The square would represent four others of these. The rhythm. Um, that there is something that... Yes, uh, you know, they're like counting from 1 to 12, going from the semi-sextile all the way up to the dodecile. Uh, I don't know. I, that that might be a correspondence and that might be a way to get at it. Yeah. I, I don't know. This is speculation. This is, you know, it's like anything goes. and Sometimes you have to try hundreds and hundreds of things before you find something that works. That would be very logical. Yeah. Uh. Well, I have an errand to run, so I'm going to disappear. Just leave the doors open. Nothing, nothing's going to be stolen.